Medistand. Understanding Medicine. I'm Professor Azizur Rahman, and today we're going to discuss very, very close association between type 2 diabetes and atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. We all know that type 2 diabetes is notorious to cause premature and accelerated atherosclerosis and through that macrovascular complications. And I mentioned in my last lecture that 75% of the morbidity and mortality related to type 2 diabetes comes through atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So there's a very, very strong relationship between these two. I think that justified the term cardiobetes. Now everybody would not recognize this term uh, as a condition, but I certainly feel that this conveys the message very well. Type 2 diabetes patients, uh, they are so prone to develop uh, these complications. Of course, there are other macrovascular complications also, but heart involvement is the commonest and uh, there's a major target uh, for the diabetes. Uh, so I think calling it cardiobetes is justified. Uh, so I think we're going to discuss how this happens. Glycemia is the tip of iceberg. Now, of course, this is not to undermine the importance of glycemia because the very definition of diabetes is based on glucose or the surrogate marker of glucose in the form of HbA1c and all therapeutic goals are based on glucose or A1c and many complications are direct effect of glucose like metabolic complication and glycemia plays extremely important role in the pathogenesis of microvascular complication. They also play a role in the pathogenesis of the, this hyperglycemia also plays an important role in the pathogenesis of macrovascular complications. But in addition, there are many hidden uh, conditions uh, underneath. So we just see hyperglycemia because that is something easy to measure and that is what we know. But there is a whole lot of problem underneath which we can't see or we have to do some extra effort to see them. So these are called associated condition. I'll just go through these conditions and see what we can do to prevent their contribution to the pathogenesis of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. A patient with diabetes are very unfortunate in a way that they are, I think, have multifold risk of developing ischemic heart disease and its further consequences. Number one, approximately, they are three times more likely to develop a coronary event in the form of uh, angina, unstable angina, or other manifestations. And then the three times more likely to die suddenly before reaching the hospital. And then those who reach hospital, they are three times more likely to end up in complications or not for not being a good candidate for revascularization because they tend to have diffuse disease. So the more definitive treatment in the form of angioplasty may not be possible in these patients. So the overall risk of developing cardiovascular event and then further complications of cardiovascular event are many fold uh, increase in patients with type 2 diabetes. This is very interesting study uh, from China and what they did was they studied the patients who presented to them with the myocardial infarction and they assessed their glycemic status. Now, the figures were very astonishing. Only 23% people who presented with myocardial infarction, they have normal glucose tolerance. That means their glucose is normal and they were when they were challenged with glucose, uh, it still remained within normal range. So they were non-diabetic. But the rest of them, they were either pre-diabetic, they already had 
diabetes or they were diagnosed diabetic on the uh, when they were investigated at the time of developing migraine infarction or at least they had pre-diabetes so almost uh, three-fourth 75 percent had some type of disc glycemia either established diabetes or they were diagnosed for the first time at the time of developing migraine infarction or they were diagnosed with pre-diabetes and pre-diabetes i'm sure you know is a condition where your glucose and hb1c is not normal but hasn't yet reached the level where diabetes is diagnosed so this is also an early form of diabetes so that indicates how, how strong the relationship between diabetes and atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or myocardial infarction is. We know that as our HbA1c increases, the chances of developing a coronary event increases. This is the data from UKPDS. Those who had higher HbA1c, they tend to develop coronary events or cerebrovascular accidents more frequently than those who had lower HbA1c and there was almost a linear relationship. And we just hope, and there is some evidence also, that if we can bring down their HbA1c, there should be a reversal of this phenomenon, at least there should be a reduction if not to the fully uh, if not fully then at least partial reduction in the incidence of coronary events is expected with good glycemic control with if we bring the bring down their hba1c now this is one very interesting observation that macrovascular complication may actually precede the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes now, this is the HbA1c. This is the timeline. This is the level when we make a diagnosis of diabetes. Anybody who has HbA1c of 6.5 or high is now uh, labeled diabetic. Now, complications like microvascular complication and metabolic complication, they develop after they reach this A1c level. So, they are true complication of diabetes. They, they develop after you develop diabetes. But macrovascular complication, they actually develop maybe several years. They start developing several years before they are diagnosed with A1C. Now, if you study these patients, you would know that before developing myocardial infarction, before developing diabetes, the chances of having coronary events in them were higher. So there is some associated condition or even lesser degree of hyperglycemia is responsible for macrovascular complication. Now that highlights why the impact of good glycemic control on prevention of macrovascular complication is not as great as we see the effect on metabolic and microvascular complication. And that also tells us that in addition to glycemic control, we need to do something more. What causes macrovascular complication? Of course, hyperglycemia is important. Hyperglycemia can cause uh, production of advanced glycated end products. These are highly atherogenic. They can glycate all proteins. They can glycate LDL, they can glycate our endothelial cells, macrophages, foam cells. So all uh, cells can become abnormal and they can uh, make an atheroma. But there are many associated conditions which may be due to diabetes or there is some common factor behind diabetes and these conditions. We know that uh, it, there is a common uh, genotype and common phenotype between diabetes and many associated conditions. This is an interesting actually two studies, uh, the two similar uh, studies and, and they, what they showed was and one was that these are the, uh, the publication sites and type 2 diabetes and prior myocardial infarction. 
there is similar risk of CVD mortality. Now let me explain this a little more detail. These are four charts in both sides, right? Now those patients who were not diabetic, but they had prior MI, compared to those patients who were diabetic, but no, they did not have prior MI, both had similar risk of dying a cardiac death. Similarly, in this study, those who were not diabetic, but they had prior MI, or those who were diabetic, but they did not have prior MI, in them, in this Finland heart study, the chances of mortality was almost similar. So that means we know that if somebody has already uh, suffered from myocardial infarction, in that person, the chances of having another MI and death are very high. Now, having new diabetes carries the same risk of having a sudden death. So th that translated into a slogan, uh, diabetes as coronary artery disease risk equivalent. Now, with time, we have realized that that was actually an overstatement. Most type 2 diabetic patients, they do not carry as much risk as somebody with existing coronary artery disease has. But I think diabetic patient, if they have like 10 years history of diabetes, then they become equivalent to coronary artery disease. So let me now restate diabetes which is there for 10 years, uh, type 2 diabetes, it, the risk of having another fatal cardiovascular event is the same as in somebody who has existing coronary artery disease but no diabetes. So that emphasizes the importance of treatment of uh, diabetes. You all know that somebody who develops migraine infarction, he is so uh, motivated to change his life uh, because he knows that something serious has happened and the same can happen again. I think we need to explain to our type 2 diabetic patient who has the history of 10 years that same thing can happen to them. So they need to intensify their lifestyle changes so that they don't develop a coronary event. Now, the effect of glycemic control, uh, impact of intensive therapy for diabetes, this is the summary of some major clinical trials. You're all familiar with this UK PDA study, which was in type 2 diabetic patients. Uh, this was, there was a compa comparison between conventional control and tight control using whatever agents were available. Then there is a DCCT trial, diabetes complication uh, trial uh, that in this Again, they compared uh, conventional control, diabetes control and complication trial. They, com they compared conventional control with tighter control. Now you can see that there, there is very good effect on microvascular complication, but the effect on macrovascular complication was not that great in both the studies. Only those patients who were in the intensive phase and they were on metformin, they showed some reduction in macrovascular complication. Similarly, the effect on mortality was not that great, but the effect on mortality was uh, seen uh, in those patients who were on metformin. So this indicates that the effect of glycemic control is not that great when it comes to macrovascular complication because, I mean, of course, they are at least taking uh, the conventional treatment, uh, but the tighter control did not offer any additional benefit, except in those who were on metformin. Now, then there is another series of studies. These are ACCORD, ADVANCED, and VAGT trial. And the basic theme of these studies were that if you try to achieve better glycemic control, uh, when their diabetes is there for quite some time and UKPDS and DCCT were in relatively shorter duration of diabetes but these one were when they had established diabetes for a very long period. Now in them also tightening their glycemic control improved microvascular complication, no big effect on the macrovascular complication 
in fact uh, the chances of death the mortality increase in one of the studies called accord and uh, you all know that accord had to be terminated prematurely because of this increased death although we 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 know that this happened in those patients who were assigned to tighter control but it did not actually occur who who actually developed a better control so i think this data is difficult to interpret but it was very discouraging and it showed that very tight control later in life once somebody has already developed macrovascular complication is perhaps not rewarding now this is a study of uh, the, the summary of accord advance and vadt and i'll just go through it and uh, just to make my point that glycemic control is important if done early but glycemic control may not be as important if it is done late and in some cases it may be counterproductive now in all these three studies there was a fairly big number and there were people were fairly old 60 plus and their duration of diabetes was long and they already had 35 32 to 40 percent of them they already had cvd in the form of uh, prior angina myocardial infarction or angioplasty or taa and their bmi was more than normal so they were all overweight people and their baseline hb1c was fairly high that means uh, their glucose was not very well controlled and by tightening uh, the anti uh, hyperglycemic medication it was possible in that tighter group it was possible to achieve better a1c 6.4 versus 7.5 6.5 versus 7.3 and 6.9 versus 8.4 so even in these patients it was actually possible to get better glycemic control uh, with the tightening of their medication uh, but the there was relative risk reduction in cvd events very very modest action and uh, the incidence of death increase in accord study so these are the results to again emphasizing the fact and these studies were published in a very renowned journal new england journal of medicine so which we trust very much so i think the observation says that controlling glycemia is very important but you have to do it early now <clears throat> some potential contributor to this glucose paradox why glycemic control does not uh, leads to prevention of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease tardiness of the therapeutic intervention maybe we take too long to take to start a medication or maybe some of the anti diabetic agents have some adverse effect on atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease at least theoretically that is a possibility and then comorbidities that is actually the main factor many of the comorbidities dyslipidemia obesity inflammation or hypertension now of course nowadays there is a lot of emphasis on addressing these complication no treatment plan is complete unless we address these uh, comorbidities but if you just focus on glucose you may be happy that you are maintaining a good hb1c but these complication will still develop so that is uh, i think important uh, coming to the specific effects of oral anti diabetic drugs on cvd i think you can uh, divide them into three groups those which are neutral now by that i mean they definitely have benefits through glycemic control we know glycemia contributes to atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and insulin and dpp4 both they should reduce the incidence of macrovascular disease by controlling glycemia but they are neutral in the sense that they do not have any direct action of their own so they have benefit through glucose control but there are studies which have mentioned this rosiglitazone 
and sulfonylureas both could actually have direct harmful effect again they have good effect through glycemic control but they these drugs could have maybe slight negative effect on atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease uh, the rosiglitazone you all know was withdrawn uh, and then because uh, those patients who had already existing coronary artery disease when rosiglitazone was used in them and retrospective analysis showed that the chance of death increased in those and sulfonylurea sulfonylurea uh, in meta analysis there is slight indication that there could be slight increased risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease in those who are on sulfonylurea rosiglitazone was later re-examined and it was concluded that there is perhaps no conclusive evidence that there is bad effect of rosiglitazone so that's why i just put a question mark there is no definite proven harmful effect of these drugs but at least they do not extend any additional benefit then there are some drugs this is very interesting some drugs these drugs they definitely extend benefit through glycemic control but they have their own benefits metformin was shown in ukpds pioglitazone has been shown to have a beneficial effect through i think improvement in lipids sglt2 inhibitors liraglutide they are all beneficial so uh, what is common in these groups i think the common is uh, that they have direct effect and all these drugs have gone through what we call cardiovascular outcome trials these drugs they were there in the market uh, before this uh, fda mandated that all new drugs must go through uh, must demonstrate their cardiovascular safety after rosiglitazone rosiglitazone story so these drugs have gone through cvo trials and in the next slide i'm going to show you a summary of uh, cvo trials of course it will not be possible to go into the detail but just to give you some idea uh, how important they are now this is uh, i hope you can read them but i'll just make them more readable by highlighting uh, these are series of studies 2013 14 15 16 and these are the series of studies on various agents uh, first of all this t course was about citagliptin it was proven that citagliptin is cardiovascular neutral and then empireg was about empagliflozin it was shown not only empagliflozin is neutral but it actually is beneficial especially in heart failure and then there was a leader trial and this was about uh, liraglutide again it showed not only liraglutide was safe it actually extended some additional benefit in terms of prevention of acute coronary events or mace uh, what they call major adverse cardiovascular events so i think there was a reduction in leader uh, then sustain is about semaglutide another glp1 receptor agonist this is also glp receptor agonist so glp receptor agonists are useful and similarly xl lixacenadide that is also a glp receptor agonist and then rewind is duloglutide so all glp receptors glp receptor agonists they have shown at least cardiovascular safety i think xl has shown just safety but no superiority over placebo but other drugs they have shown superiority over placebo then there was a study called declare and this was about dapagliflozin and dapagliflozin and uh, empagliflozin they also uh, offer protection against atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease but mostly in heart failure and heart failure related hospitalization and deaths so what is the result of these studies Con conclusion from these studies that we should use metformin uh, as a first line therapy that is what we all do then after metformin before waiting for it to fail while they are on metformin we should have their atherosclerotic cardiovascular status determined they should have their blood pressure measured they should have their lipid measured they have their 
they should have their risk calculated through the calculators and if their risk is more than 10 percent that the risk of developing coronary artery disease in next 10 years is more than 10 percent then they would fall in this increased risk group if they already have atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease of course they are in this group now in this group then the second line of drug is glp1 receptor agonist of course their glycemic control remains important and GLP-1 receptor agonists are very potent glucose lowering therapies but the studies have shown which I just demonstrated that leader trial, sustain, rewind and excel they have shown that if you bring their glucose to normal level using these agents the chances of developing atherosclerotic to cardiovascular disease is further minimized. Now if for some reason you cannot use GLP receptor agonists in this group then a substitute the alternate would be SGLT2 inhibitors. If they have heart failure or reduced ejection fracture or CKD then SGLT2 inhibitors would also be uh, first line of treatment among second after metformin. Uh, DPP4 would be considered neutral and sulfonylureas generally speaking are not exactly preferred in this group. Now Additional risk factors, I mentioned that these additional risk factors, they contribute to the pathogenesis of uh, 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 coronary artery disease. How common are they? Now this is very interesting that majority, look at this pie diagram, majority would have one or more uh, additional risk factors with diabetes only minority would have just disc, uh, hyperglycemia other would have some additional risk factors that are shown in the next slide this is an interesting slide uh, a busy one so i think uh, i would be able to explain to you how these factors contribute to the atherosclerosis ascvd means premature ather atherosclerosis now there is vessel here it could be a coronary artery it could be cerebral vessel or it could be a peripheral vessel atherosclerosis is already going on and there may be clot formation that will lead to occlusion of the vessel and ultimate uh, damage to the organ now let me examine these different factors one by one first of all age advanced glycated end products this is the result of chronic uncontrolled hyperglycemia and this has been emphasized already then hyperinsulinemia because we know insulin is a growth factor in type 2 diabetes even before the diagnosis these patients are hyperinsulinemic it is the hyperinsulinemia which is keeping their glucose controlled uh, because there is insulin resistance and there is uh, compensatory hyperinsulinemia and this in hyperinsulinemia through to, due to its uh, uh, through its growth promoting ability could actually promote growth of the cells which are responsible for atherma formation then is the insulin resistance insulin resistance is associated with increased free fatty acids and hypertriglyceridemia so that is also responsible uh, uh, in the pathogenesis of atherosclerosis. Then very important is dyslipidemia. Most patients with type 2 diabetes, they have some type of dyslipidemia. Now please note down that we are using the word dyslipidemia. We do not call it hyperlipidemia because there may be some qualitative abnormalities and some quantitative abnormalities. For example, LDL particles, LDLs, LDL level may be normal uh, in these patients but LDL particles are small and highly atherogenic. So there are qualitative defects. Now <clears throat> fat tissue which is present in our viscera, they release many things and many inflammatory markers. One of them is TNF-alpha, tumor necrosis uh, factor alpha. This is a pro-inflammatory marker and may accelerate inflammation and promote atherosclerosis. Then these uh, adipocytes, they release free fatty acids. These free fatty acids are brought to the liver through circulation. Uh, 
and the liver convert them into VLDL and triglyceride. So that causes increased level of VLD and triglyceride, which also cause uh, makes this our serum lipemic. And in some way, they also reduce our HDL level. And we know HDL is protective because HDL is what brings these fatty acids back to the liver, reducing, uh, they bring uh, LDL to the liver, uh, lowering the LDL level. So low, having low HDL means that they would have high LDL level. So that is another contributor. So all would cause uh, at least contribute to atherosclerosis. Then we have thrombotic and fibrinolytic factors. You know, liver produces this CRP, C-reactive protein, uh, which is a pro-inflammatory -inf marker. Then there may be increased fibrinogen. Fibrinogen is very much needed for clot formation. Then there is increased level of plasminogen activator inhibitor. So since inhibitor is not there, so and then uh, once clot is formed, it will not be lysed. So all these factors, they would promote thrombosis. You know, atherosclerosis may be absolutely asymptomatic. Only when there is some erosion, some inflammation causes erosion, or, and then that promotes thrombosis. These patients are already at a hypercoagulable state, and they develop then clot, and that culminates into market infarction or stroke. Then these patients have hypertension and hypertension must be controlled in these patients. UK PDS has shown that controlling the blood pressure in these patients actually helps to lower their diabetes related complication. And preferred agents are ACE inhibitors and ARBs. All these factors still do not explain the increased risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So there are some genetic factors. We do not understand them very well, but we know that two patients with similar profile regarding glucose control and regarding these factors could have different incidence of uh, myocardial infarction. That is perhaps explained on the genetic basis. So this was uh, uh, the very complex slide, but I hope I was able to give you some uh, explanation. So all these factors, they cause endothelial dysfunction, they reduce nitrous oxide level, they, this is vasodilator, and they increase endothelial level, this is vasoconstrictor, and they also stimulate macrophages and smooth muscles and turn them into foam cells, and foam cells of course are fat-filled cells, which is a precursor for the atherosclerotic process. And they also, the increased inflammation, these patients, as indicated by increased CRP and increased TNF-alpha, may be responsible for erosion and thrombus formation. So this is the explanation how these mechanisms, all these conditions, they interact to produce atherosclerosis. Now, <clears throat> I have tried to make a point, I have tried to make a point that Diabetes is not just hyperglycemia. There are many associated conditions, and trials have actually shown that if you address these associated conditions, you can reduce the incidence of uh, ASCVD. Now, let me very briefly examine these. First of all, these are glucose-related trials. Insulin, non-significant but 41% reduction in macrovascular complication. Metformin, 39% sulfonylurea 16% but not significant, SGLT2 liraglutide they have significant 22% reduction, 38% reduction in coronary events if you use these agents liraglutide and SGLT2 to control their diabetes along with metformin. Then studies on lipid, simvastatin, pravastatin and in these studies 4S studies and care studies targeting LDL, there has been 42% reduction and 27% uh, reduction respectively in these two trials to bring down their atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. We are treating diabetic patients, but if we address the lipids by using statins, we can substantially reduce their 
complication of myocardial infarction. So this is very rewarding. Then BP, these are the studies using flotipine, enalapril, lusartan uh, in the HOT study, HOPE study, LIFE studies addressing their blood pressure or diastole blood pressure. There has been significant reduction in the, on, uh, incident, the incidence of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Then finally, use of antiplatelet aspirin used in the study called ASEN and uh, outcome was uh, the, the end, end point was incidence of CVD and there was 12% reduction but there was almost equivalent risk of increased GA bleeding. So currently aspirin is not recommended for patients with diabetes without additional risk factors. If some diabetic patient has additional risk factors and his stomach accepts aspirin then it would be beneficial. Now this brings me to the towards the end of this presentation. I call it A, B, C, D of type 2 diabetes. Our objective is to prevent death due to uh, macrovascular disease and to achieve that objective we must address A, B, C, D all of them. A is for A1C so we must bring their HbA1C to less than 7 or 6.5 if they're younger or 8 may be acceptable if they're elderly with CVD and the preferred agents are metformin, GLP receptor agonists and SGLT2 inhibitors. Of course our primary pro priority is to bring down their A1C but I think if we use these agents it would be better because it has been shown that these agents have additional benefits. Number two, their blood pressure must also be controlled. Their blood pressure should be less than 130 by 80. Normally 140 by 80, uh, 140 by 90 is considered uh, uh, the normal blood pressure, less than that. But in the diabetic population, uh, I think if we, we treat them, we must bring their blood pressure to 130 by 80 or less. And preferably we should use RAS blockers. Although uh, many uh, organizations, European Society of Cardiology, and uh, European Association of Study of Disease, uh, uh, Diabetes, they, they say that ACE inhibitors should be used. But JNC8, uh, they say that it is good enough if you can bring down their blood pressure to 140 by 90 and they don't mind. They, they say that use general guidelines, no special guidelines for diabetes. They, they say if patients are hypertensive, just bring them down to normal level. In other words, they did not acknowledge the fact that bringing to the uh, more lower level is helpful. But most people in the world, they I think follow these guidelines. In diabetic patients, we try to bring their blood pressure to this range and the preferred agents are ACE inhibitors and ARBs. So this is B and then LDL, C is for cholesterol. LDL cholesterol must be less than 100 mg per deciliter for all diabetics and less than 70 mg per deciliter if there is existing coronary disease or we should aim for more than 50% reduction from the baseline. Uh, although we have many drugs but statins are most useful and those patients who do not respond to statins or those who do not tolerate statins a new drug called a group of drug called PC, PCSK9 inhibitors are there but they are very expensive and injectable therapies. Then D is the use of aspirin. Aspirin the trade name is Dispirin just to make it easy to remember A, B, C, D I use the short of um, uh, the first letter from the trade name Dispirin. So if patient has CVD or has got diabetes with two additional CVD risk factors Dispirin should be used. It should be avoided if somebody has GI tolerability issue and especially if there are no additional factors and dual antiplatelet therapy is indicated for those diabetic patients who undergo uh, acute coronary who undergo angioplasty or those who suffer from acute coronary syndrome. So although we know a lot about the risk 
involved in increased incidence of atherosclerotic or cardiovascular disease but still a lot is there to learn because known factors they do not explain there is still some residual risk so i think we need to know more i think some scientists have identified multiple genes which are behind this uh, pathogenesis of uh, premature atherosclerosis so good glycemic control is important and control of associated conditions is also important but i think we need more understanding of this process and of course we need more therapies to address the residual risk with that so this brings us to the end of this presentation it was a complex concept i hope i was able to clarify some of your uh, uh, some of your uh, uh, queries uh, i really look forward to see you in my next presentation and this was professor aziz rahman from medistan thank you